Hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. <laughs> How long do we know each other? My gosh, uh, we've known each other about 15 years. Does that sound about right? That's, yeah. Well, when we met, yes, I was a coach and I saw your son playing basketball. I've always been an educator, uh, but I didn't want to go to the traditional route and, and teach in a public school, even though I was certified to do that. And um, it just so happened that a, a, a couple of positions opened where they allowed me to uh, um, to educate the masses, so to speak, on on particular subjects. And so um, it slowly but surely kind of evolved into a public speaking position. But it all came out from me being a health educator. Obviously, this takes special training, not training only in a way of education, but as a human being. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. To me, it's an art form to, to do it well. Uh, now, I don't know if I do it well, but I've been doing it for a long time. And uh, the art form comes in, in the form of, of uh, gaining perspective. So uh, I always told myself at first, because it's a, it's a nerve-wracking thing to do, is to get up in front of a lot of people and say what you have to say. But uh, I always said, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And as simple as that sounds, it gives me perspective. The, the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And it allowed me the freedom to say what I felt was important and to get the points across I wanted to get across and fortunately it's it resonates with people yes and so when you present usually the first the purpose of your presentation is to educate but also to to make an impact for a change mm -hmm. is that right it is it, it, it's absolutely true what I do is 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 very similar to marketing and an individual has to make a decision whether the the cost of adopting a particular behavior or stopping a particular behavior is going to be outweighed by its benefits uh, and then that's a very individual thing and so that's that's the process I take so when I give information on, on health and wellness um, I fully understand that that perceived cost can, is very high and so as a result, um, the way I speak and, and, and what I say, um, it's, it's not a, I don't tell people what to do. You know, I give them information and I empower them to make their own decisions. And I count on other people's intelligence. And when I give information, I know that people make good decisions more than they don't. Uh, I have data to prove it, and with, with our youth, and and you know, with parents, I just know that to be true. You do have a goal to communicate something to those people, and let's say that group is uh, distracted. What do you do? <laughs> it depends on my audience too. If I'm talking to a group of youth, a, a group of kids, I feel a little more, um, I guess, empowered to say, "Hey." put your phone down I see. Um, but you want to know what a, a technique I use please if if a if two kids are talking and, when, and I'm in a classroom for example and two kids are talking what I will do is I will continue to to my messaging and continue to present except I walk over right to them and I'm presenting to those two I don't stop um, you make it personal absolutely and I'm I, talking I, to I, you. I, I, I'm talking to you directly. I don't say stop. I don't say, hey, listen to me. I don't do that. But I continue saying what I'm saying, but I'll talk directly to you. And and that's a technique that works. I don't want to call anybody out, but I'm calling them out. The subject matter of which I speak is, is a lot of time with substance use disorders, mental health issues, suicide intervention. So I know that, for example, no one wants to be uh, an addict. No one plans on being an addict. No one wants to be there. Yeah. And I take that knowledge. And everything I talk about, Milan, is data-driven. It is through research. So what I do is I interpret the data, and I put it in such a way that people can understand. Can I, can I give you an example? Yes, please. I talk about brain maturation, for one thing. And I talk about how the brain takes about 25 to 30 years to mature, and it matures from back to front. And so rather than tell a, a student that, I will ask a student, have you ever cried without knowing why? 
and it's inevitable that they have. Have you ever been angry without knowing why you're angry? And we talk about with you and your parents, you know, your parents yelled at you when you got up too late and you just don't want to hear it, so you slam your door and you go into your room and you listen to music. Um, that's part of brain maturation. And what that means is, is the, the brain maturing, decisions are being based in part on emotion, not reason. And so that's how I relate it. I take the data and I take the physiological information on, on how the brain works and I put it in, in terms that they can understand and they can relate to. And, and that resonates. So when I ask a student, have you ever cried without knowing why, they're like, oh yeah, that resonates. So I don't talk about the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens and the limbic system. I don't talk so much about that. I talk about if they have a comfort food. And when they eat a comfort food, you get the same reaction as when you take a drug. It's just when you take a drug, it's a lot more. They can relate to that. So everything I say is data. It's driven by research and data. And it's scientifically defensible. But I put it in such a way that they understand. That's where the art comes in. You said something that caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Something interesting. You said decisions are made based on emotion. Is that true? That's that scientifically proven? Yeah, well, so as, we're, as we grow, that brain maturation, that beautiful, gorgeous brain that we have, it matures, as I said, from back to front. So that midbrain and that limbic system, um, uh, we make a lot of decisions when we're growing up based on emotion, on impulsivity, not necessarily reason and judgment. And, and cons we don't think ahead. Do you remember being a, a kid and thinking six years ahead? No. Do you remember no, being no. a kid and thinking six weeks ahead? No. Our life is right here and it's right now. And so we, we put it in terms of like peer pressure and things like that. We don't want to be perceived as different. And, and so sometimes when we make a decision, we make a decision not based on reason or consequences or, or um, it's, it's on emotion and it's on in, it being impulsive, which is a wonderful part of our brain. It, it's a beautiful part of our brain and we need it. Sometimes it can get us in trouble a little bit. And for some, more than others. I realize that every audience I speak to, regardless of age, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of anything, that um, they're individuals. And um, how I put it is that you know, we're all in this same room, but I can hold up an object and I can, you and I can see two different things. And the reason for that is the path that you took to get here is different than my path. I don't know what your home life is like. I have no idea what you've experienced. None. But I can tell you it's different than mine. So when I speak, I, I realize that. And, and I don't pretend to know what, you're, what, what you've experienced. I don't pretend to know what, you, what, what you've gone through. But it's unique. And, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's a big deal to me because every individual has their own individual path and you know what makes them feel something what makes them um, from a marketing standpoint what makes them realize that that cost is is going to be outweighed by the benefit it's very individual and so making blanket statements and things like that I, I try very hard not to do and I acknowledge that individuality and again that resonates with 12 year olds, it resonates with 85 year olds um, because it's, it's true and, and that's a big philosophy in, in why I do th things the way I do it, it yeah. professionally. Public speaking is about relating. Yes. So is music. Oh, I would agree. <laughs> yeah? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. How much do you know about Bulgarian music? Let's see. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know nothing of Bulgarian music. Okay, well, I would like to try something, you know. I will play a few pieces for you, mm -hmm. and I'll ask you, please tell me, how does this sound? How does it affect you? Does it affect you at all? Okay. Yeah? Okay, we okay. can do that? Sure. All right. What do you think?
honestly, the first thing that came to my mind is how hard that must have been to play. <laughs> the speed and, and frenetic. To be honest, it's it it's not my my type of music. It was it was um, it was confusing. Let's listen to the next one. <laughs> All right. That was beautiful. It, it, what came to my mind is spiritual, biblical. What, what the picture I had in my mind when I was listening to it is if I'm wandering around, you know, the Holy Land. That that's what came to my mind's eye. It was, uh, it was, it was pleasant. It was peaceful. It was spiritual. It was calming. Again, very frenetic and very fast, and um, it was very, uh, um, it was on the surface, it didn't go as deep as, as the slower music, and so it was harder for me to, I guess, to relate to it. I, I, I don't relate to it as much. Yeah. And the, the instrument, do, do you recognize the sound of the instrument, the, the solo instrument? No. No? no. It, it's a backpipe. Oh, Bulgarian really? Bulgarian backpipe, yeah. I never would have said that. This is something that I would denote with, uh, that I would hear in a movie score. Uh, the, again, the, the picture that came to my mind was a, was a vast expanse and, and people moving, or, and maybe with mountains in the background. So, uh, you know what, I, I kind of related to that. I, I thought it was kind of a, a pretty. And, the way I, I relate to music is if it puts a picture in my mind, and that, that's what this did. Much like that other one, it's spiritual. It's uh, um, calming, and I, I would listen to this to relax uh, and to put me in a pensive, thoughtful. If I was pensive and thoughtful, and and um, I, I, that's what it reminded me of. Again, it's spiritual. I can't come up with a better word, but it, to me, it's spiritual. What I call this style is ambient. Uh -huh. uh, exotic ambient. Mm -hmm. So it is. The musical style is not typical, traditional. Yeah. It has the elements, but the purpose is not to portray any particular style, but to create an atmosphere, as you say. And yes. It's, and it's a deeper, personal yes. reach to 
every individual maybe feel sorrow, maybe feel relaxed, maybe you know meditate. Yes. Yeah. It cre- and I like the way you put it. It creates an atmosphere, and and that atmosphere is going to be different depending on who's sitting in this chair and, and hearing that. But for me, that atmosphere is yeah, meditative, spiritual, um, and and uh, again, uh, biblical. You know um, what the title of the piece is? What? Beyond. Yeah. Yeah. See, it works. <laughs> That is celebratory. This is what I would hear at a birthday party or a wedding or a um, when people are enjoying themselves, having fun and family getting together and friends getting together. This is what I'm thinking yeah. of when I hear this. Well, that's great because the title of the piece is called Cheers. Yes, it is. I, I didn't know that, that but it's well, perfect. So what does that say? That means the, the music resonated with, with me in the way it was meant to resonate. 